Chapter 15 of The Gods of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Gods of Mars. Chapter 15 Flight and Pursuit. I could not have been unconscious more than a few seconds, and yet I know that I was unconscious, for the next thing I realized was that a growing radiance was illuminating the corridor about me and the eyes were gone. I was unharmed except for a slight bruise upon my forehead, where it had struck the stone flagging as I fell. I sprang to my feet to ascertain the cause of the light. It came from a torch in the hand of one of a party of four green warriors, who were coming rapidly down the corridor toward me. They had not yet seen me, and so I lost no time in slipping into the first intersecting corridor that I could find. This time, however, I did not advance so far away from the main corridor as on the other occasion that had resulted in my losing Tars Tarkas and his guards. The party came rapidly toward the opening of the passageway in which I crouched against the wall. As they passed, I breathed a sigh of relief. I had not been discovered, and, best of all, the party was the same that I had followed into the pits. It consisted of Tars Tarkas and his three guards. I fell in behind them, and soon we were at the cell in which the great Thark had been chained. Two of the warriors remained without, while the man with the keys entered with the Thark to fasten his irons upon him once more. The two outside started to stroll slowly in the direction of a spiral runway, which led to the floors above, and in a moment were lost to view beyond a turn in the corridor. The torch had been stuck in a socket beside the door so that its rays illuminated both the corridor and the cell at the same time. As I saw the two warriors disappear, I approached the entrance to the cell, with a well-defined plan already formulated. While I disliked the thought of carrying out the thing that I had decided upon, there seemed no alternative if Tars Tarkas and I were to go back together to my little camp in the hills. Keeping near the wall, I came quite close to the door to Tars Tarkas' cell and there I stood with my longsword above my head, grasped with both hands, that I might bring it down in one quick cut upon the skull of the jailer as he emerged. I disliked to dwell upon what followed after I heard the footsteps of the man as he approached the doorway. It is enough that within another minute or two Tars Tarkas, wearing the medal of a Warhoon chief, was hurrying down the corridor toward the spiral runway, bearing the Warhoon's torch to light his way. A dozen paces behind him followed John Carter, Prince of Helium. The two companions of the man who lay now beside the door of the cell that had been Tars Tarkas had just started to ascend the runway as the Thark came in view. "'Why so long, Tangama?' cried one of the men. "'I had trouble with a lock,' replied Tars Tarkas, "'and now I find that I have left my short-sword in the Thark's cell. Go you on, I'll return and fetch it.' "'As you will, Tangama,' replied he who had before spoken. "'We shall see you above directly.' "'Yes,' replied Tars Tarkas, and turned as though to retrace his steps to the cell, but he only waited until the two had disappeared at the floor above. Then I joined him, we extinguished the torch, and together we crept toward the spiral incline that led to the upper floors of the building. At the first floor we found that the hallway ran but halfway through, necessitating the crossing of a rear room full of green folk, ere we could reach the inner courtyard, so there was but one thing left for us to do, and that was to gain the second floor and the hallway through which I had traversed the length of the building. Cautiously we ascended. We could hear the sounds of conversation coming from the room above, but the hall still was unlighted, nor was any one in sight as we gained the top of the runway. Together we threaded the long hall and reached the balcony overlooking the courtyard, without being detected. At our right was the window letting into the room in which I had seen Tangama and the other warriors as they started to Tars Tarka's cell earlier in the evening. His companions had returned here, and we now overheard a portion of their conversation. "'What can be detaining Tangama?' asked one. He certainly could not be all this time fetching his short-sword from the Thark's cell," spoke another. "'His short-sword?' asked a woman. "'What mean you?' 
Tan Gama left his short sword in the thark's cell, explained the first speaker, and left us at the runway to return and get it. Tan Gama wore no short sword this night, said the woman. It was broken in today's battle with the thark, and Tan Gama gave it to me to repair. See, I have it here. And as she spoke, she drew Tan Gama's short sword from beneath her sleeping silks and furs. The warriors sprang to their feet. There is something amiss here, cried one. Tis even what I myself thought when Tan Gama left us at the runway, said another. Bethought then that his voice sounded strangely. Come, let us hasten to the pits. We waited to hear no more. Slinging my harness into a long single strap, I lowered Tars Tarkas to the courtyard beneath, and an instant later dropped to his side. We had spoken scarcely a dozen words since I had felled Tangama at the cell door and seen in the torch's light the expression of utter bewilderment upon the great dark's face. By this time, he had said, I should have learned to wonder at nothing which John Carter accomplishes. That was all. He did not need to tell me that he appreciated the friendship which had prompted me to risk my life to rescue him, nor did he need to say that he was glad to see me. This fierce green warrior had been the first to greet me that day, now twenty years gone, which had witnessed my first advent upon Mars. He had met me with leveled spear and cruel hatred in his heart as he charged down upon me, bending low at the side of his mighty thoat as I stood beside the incubator of his horde upon the dead sea-bottom beyond Korad. And now, among the inhabitants of two worlds, I counted none a better friend than Taurus Tarkas, Jeddak of the Tharks. As we reached the courtyard, we stood in the shadows beneath the balcony for a moment to discuss our plans. "'There be five now in the party, Taurus Tarkas,' I said. "'Duvia, Zodar, Carthoris, and ourselves. We shall need five thoats to bear us.' "'Carthoris!' he cried. "'Your son?' "'Yes.' I found him in the prison of Shador on the Sea of Omin in the land of the firstborn. I know not of these places, John Kata. Be they upon Barsoom? Upon and below, my friend. But wait until we shall have made good our escape, and you shall hear the strangest narrative that ever a Barsoomian of the outer world gave ear to. Now we must steal our thoats and be well away to the north before these fellows discover how we have tricked them. In safety we reached the great gates at the far end of the courtyard, through which it was necessary to take our thoats to the avenue beyond. It is no easy matter to handle five of these great, fierce beasts, which by nature are as wild and ferocious as their masters, and held in subjection by cruelty and brute force alone. As we approached them they sniffed our unfamiliar scent, and with squeals of rage circled about us. Their long, massive necks upreared, raised their great, gaping mouths high above our heads. They are fearsome-appearing brutes at best, but when they are roused they are fully as dangerous as they look. The thoat stands a good ten feet at the shoulder. His hide is sleek and hairless, and of a dark slate color on back and sides, shading down his eight legs to a vivid yellow at the huge, padded, nailless feet. The belly is pure white. A broad, flat tail, larger at the tip than at the root, completes the picture of this ferocious green Martian mount, a fit war-steed for these warlike people. As the thoats are guided by telepathic means alone, there is no need for a rein or bridle, and so our object now was to find two that would obey our unspoken commands. As they charged about us, we succeeded in mastering them sufficiently to prevent any concerted attack upon us but the din of their squealing was certain to bring investigating warriors into the courtyard were it to continue much longer. At length I was successful in reaching the side of one great brute, and ere he knew what I was about I was firmly seated astride his glossy back. A moment later Tars Tarkas had caught and mounted another, and then between us we herded three or four more toward the great gates. Tars Tarkas rode ahead, and leaning down to the latch, threw the barriers open, while I held the loose throats from breaking back to the herd. Then together we rode through into the avenue with our stolen mounts, and without waiting to close the gates, hurried off toward the southern boundary of the city.
Thus far our escape had been little short of marvellous, nor did our good fortune desert us, for we passed the outer purlieus of the dead city and came to our camp without hearing even the faintest sound of pursuit. Here a low whistle, the prearranged signal, apprised the balance of our party that I was returning, and we were met by the three with every manifestation of enthusiastic rejoicing. But little time was wasted in narration of our adventure. Tars Tarkas and Cathoris exchanged the dignified and formal greetings common upon Barsoom, but I could tell intuitively that the Thark loved my boy and that Cathoris reciprocated his affection. Zodar and the green Jeddak were formally presented to each other. Then Thuvia was lifted to the least fractious thoat, Zodar and Cathoris mounted two others, and we set out at a rapid pace toward the east. At the far extremity of the city we circled toward the north, and under the glorious rays of the two moons we sped noiselessly across the dead sea-bottom, away from the Warhoons and the firstborn, but to what new dangers and adventures we knew not. Toward noon of the following day we halted to rest our mounts and ourselves. The beasts we hobbled, that they might move slowly about cropping the ochre moss-like vegetation which constitutes both food and drink for them on the march. Thuvia volunteered to remain on watch while the balance of the party slept for an hour. It seemed to me that I had but closed my eyes when I felt her hand upon my shoulder and heard her soft voice warning me of a new danger. "'Arise, O Prince!' she whispered. "'There be that behind us which has the appearance of a great body of pursuers.' The girl stood pointing in the direction from whence we had come, and as I arose and looked, I too thought that I could detect a thin dark line on the far horizon. I awoke the others. Tars Tarkas, whose giant stature towered high above the rest of us, could see the farthest. "'It is a great body of mounted men,' he said, "'and they are travelling at high speed.' There was no time to be lost. We sprang to our hobbled thoats, freed them, and mounted. Then we turned our faces once more toward the north and took our flight again at the highest speed of our slowest beast. For the balance of the day and all the following night we raced across that ochre wilderness with the pursuers at our back ever gaining upon us. Slowly but surely they were lessening the distance between us. Just before dark they had been close enough for us to plainly distinguish that they were green marshes and all during the long night we distinctly heard the clanking of their accoutrements behind us. As the sun rose on the second day of our flight it disclosed the pursuing horde not a half-mile in our rear. As they saw us a fiendish shout of triumph rose from their ranks. Several miles in advance lay a range of hills, the farther shore of the Dead Sea we had been crossing. Could we but reach these hills, our chances of escape would be greatly enhanced. But Thuvia's mount, although carrying the lightest burden, already was showing signs of exhaustion. I was riding beside her when suddenly her animal staggered and lurched against mine. I saw that he was going down, but ere he fell I snatched the girl from his back and swung her to a place upon my own thoat behind me, where she clung with her arms about me. This double burden soon proved too much for my already overtaxed beast, and thus our speed was terribly diminished, for the others would proceed no faster than the slowest of us could go. In that little party there was not one who would desert another, yet we were of different countries, different colors, different races, different religions, and one of us was of a different world. We were quite close to the hills but the Warhoons were gaining so rapidly that we had given up all hope of reaching them in time. Thuvia and I were in the rear, for our beast was lagging more and more. Suddenly I felt the girl's warm lips press a kiss upon my shoulder. "'For thy sake, O Prince,' she murmured. Then her arm slipped from about my waist and she was gone. I turned and saw that she had deliberately slipped to the ground in the very path of the cruel demons who pursued us thinking that by lightening the burden of my mount it might thus be enabled to bear me to the safety of the hills. Poor child! She should have known John Carter better than that. Turning my thoat, I urged him after her, hoping to reach her side and bear her on again in our hopeless flight. 
Carthoris must have glanced behind him at about the same time, and taking in the situation, for by the time I had reached Thuvia's side he was there also, and springing from his mount he threw her upon its back, and turning the animal's head toward the hills gave the beast a sharp crack across the rump with the flat of his sword. Then he attempted to do the same with mine. The brave boy's act of chivalrous self-sacrifice filled me with pride. Nor did I care that it had wrested from us our last frail chance for escape. The Warhoons were now close upon us. Tars Tarkas and Zodar had discovered our absence and were charging rapidly to our support. Everything pointed toward a splendid ending of my second journey to Barsoom. I hated to go out without having seen my divine princess, and held her in my arms once again. But if it were not writ upon the book of fate that such was to be, then would I take the most that was coming to me, and in these last few moments that were to be vouchsafed me before I passed over into that unguessed future, I could at least give such an account of myself in my chosen vocation as would leave the Warhoons of the South food for discourse for the next twenty generations. As Carthoris was not mounted, I slipped from the back of my own mount and took my place at his side to meet the charge of the howling devils bearing down upon us. A moment later, Tars Tarkas and Zodar ranged themselves on either hand, turning their thoats loose that we might all be on equal footing. The Warhoons were perhaps a hundred yards from us when a loud explosion sounded from above and behind us, and almost at the same instant a shell burst in their advancing ranks. At once all was confusion. A hundred warriors toppled to the ground. Riderless thoats plunged hither and thither among the dead and dying. Dismounted warriors were trampled underfoot in the stampede which followed. All semblance of order had left the ranks of the green men and as they looked far above our heads to trace the origin of this unexpected attack, disorder turned to retreat, and retreat to a wild panic. In another moment they were racing as madly away from us as they had been before charging down upon us. We turned to look in the direction from whence the first report had come, and there we saw, just clearing the tops of the nearer hills, a great battleship swinging majestically through the air. Her bow-gun spoke again even as we looked, and another shell burst among the fleeing Warhoons. As she drew nearer I could not repress a wild cry of elation, for upon her bows I saw the device of helium. End of chapter 15